Hello again. Following on from my previous two videos on correspondence chess, I'm now going to present a follow-up to you. Like with the previous videos, this one will also be split into two with a part one and a part two. It is a game that I played in the 1974-5 New Zealand Correspondence Chess Association, and this is the annual report here from that period. I had been rewarded with promotion by two notches from grade 5 to 3 and was extremely satisfied to win the tournament as evidenced here. Just there, TD3 red. If you want to note how in TT2 red, Murray Chandler, the future GM, is the winner, he excelled at correspondence chess, as did Rudolf Karuzek, Alexander Alekin, and Paul Kerries. The present game afforded me the opportunity to apply the ideas of one, the Tarish variation in the French defence, to simplify the position, and thirdly, to win a nice end game. I'll just show you the tournament table. As you may recall, I started off in the, the bottom rung and I was promoted with what turned out to be just here. There you go. I lost one game on adjudication. Fair dues to my opponent. He was a very uh, competent player and uh, I met up with him in TT2 Red the following year. Now my opponent in this game is Norman French, who was the director of the Handicap Tournament. And uh, I encountered Ryan Louis for a second time, who was also promoted to that uh, TT3 Red. I beat Ryan in the first game in TT5, but it was a draw in the second game with the Sicilian Night Off. The present game, which was also published, is just here. And it's Norman French playing a French defence. So what we'll do is we'll go through the game and I'll give you my thoughts on it after a great number of years. So the first move, e4, and the French defence, e6, typically d4, d5. Now, usual here, of course, is knight c3, which permits the winnable variation, bishop b4. So. I noted at the time that Anatoly Karpov had uh, played this a few times, the Tarish variation. And of course, if black now plays bishop b4, white can simply play c3, and there's a loss of tempo for black, so that bishop b4, bishop b4 is ruled out. Black continued with c5. And I played knight g f3. Black played knight c6. And then I played bishop b5, momentarily pinning the knight. So black unpins by bishop d7. And then I believe customary in this position is e takes d. But I played here, d takes c. Now, it looks like an inaccuracy because it permits the developing recapture bishop takes c5 shortly. But I don't think it's that bad. Let's continue for a moment and imagine that Black did play bishop takes c5 on this move. So let's have a look at it. What does white do to counteract that? Well then, I think the correct move for white is to play ed. And he's hitting the knight on c6. Now 
Now then there are two lines black can recapture and then white can play castles. He gets his king nicely out of the way. We don't want the problem here with the queen coming to b6 and homing down too much there. And then white would eventually play this, hitting the bishop. So I think looking at this position, the pawns are even, but black has an isolated d pawn, which is a disadvantage. So I would say that that is, especially given that white can also threaten queen e2 check at some point, or rook e1, I think that is an advantageous position, white taking the e line. So let's just put this back for a moment. Okay, white played six dc. We're assuming that black replies with six bishop c5. White plays ed, so instead of taking on d5, we better put the uncastled king and rook back as well. I'll just double check that that is the position. Yeah. Now what happens after bishop takes f2 check? You have to be very careful. Like I've pointed out in other videos, Cecil Purdy's maxim, check all checks. So this is one to be looked into. Bishop takes f2 check. So evidently if white were to take the bishop, Black would play queen b6 check and then pick up the bishop here. And then white has foregone the opportunity of castling, which he has done anyhow. He's not in a position to castle after bishop takes f2. So where does he go? King e2 doesn't work. But let me just show you what happens after king f1. Let's put the king there. Well, black has a bit of a problem here because his knight is threatened. And not just by the pawn, because he's threatening bishop takes c6. And then, of course, when black recaptures on c6, white is able to capture the bishop on f2. And then queen b6 has no effect because this bishop will no longer be here. And so the idea being that he really has no option but to stop this attack or move the knight, in which case it would still be bishop takes d7 if the knight moved check, and we run into the same position that I've just described. So then white plays bishop takes c6, and that is a losing position for black, there's no doubt about that, because he has to take that bishop. And then with this bishop being all pre's, he would lose it and the game. So really, an immediate bishop c5 is, is not all that good. So let's put these back. So that is the position after white has played dc. So we've more or less ruled out an immediate bishop takes c5. So instead, the best move really is de, which is what? Better put this knight back as well. de there not taking on c5 at once, taking here and hitting the knight. The pawn on c5 is still able to be taken, so the way that you could look at it is there's no need to hurry that one. So that's after six de. So it's white's seventh move.
So clearly taking the pawn back is the obvious reply here. Knight e4. And you're temporarily covering that c pawn. So what does black do here? Well, of course, now that white has moved the knight away from d2, he's exposed this e1 to a5 diagonal. So black capitalizes on it by playing queen a5 check. And of course, white swiftly puts the knight back to where most people would put it on the third move to c3, covering the bishop on b5. And so now black does cease his opportunity of playing bishop takes on c5. So white castles to unpin this queen's knight and to put the king into safety and to cover f2 a wee bit more than it was before he castled. Black plays knight g e7. White plays queen e2. Taking the semi-open e line and covering the bishop on b5 twice. And covering f2. Black plays a6, wanting to get rid of that bishop. You take the knight here. You withdraw it to perhaps a4, c4. Well, I played bishop d3, and I've had a look at this position for a bit, and I'd probably still play that if it were now. I think that's, that's probably the right square for the light squared bishop. It's homing in on h7. So black can castle either king side or queen side at the moment. But for the moment, he chooses not to do that. He plays here, not to d4. And he's hitting the queen. He's also eyeing over c2 with possibilities at some point, not at the moment, but at some point perhaps, unless that knight is whipped off. Which is what I did. Like I made clear at the beginning of this video, I did want to simplify, and that's what I'm doing. So, black recaptures with his bishop on d4. So, now black is threatening white's knight on c3 twice. So really, I think this is the most sensible move, and that again is a move that I would certainly play if it were now, because the simple fact is white is now threatening to move this knight, and there's an exposed attack on black's queen on a5. So that can't be too bad. So how does black deal with this? Well, what is interesting to note here is, and it is pretty normal to take the, the semi-open sea line, so rook c8, what happens after that? Just give you a couple of seconds. Well, in fact, it allows what I was saying just a moment ago, knight b5. And here, the bishop is attacking the queen. The knight is covered by the bishop. If he should play rook takes c2, Have a look at that for a moment. Knight d6, check. We're not forking the rook and the king because the rook, of course, is here, but it would then force the king to move. And then on the next move, you could take the queen, and the rook would take my queen, and I'd take back. The fact is, though, the knight is no longer all precedes on d6 and it's not attacked by anything. So that, that will be a winning position. So after rook c8, knight b5, what about queen b6 instead of rook c2? Well, clearly, the knight would take the bishop 
the queen would take the knight back and then white would play bishop c3 and there was no defense to g7 there. So just to go through that, the knight would take there. Queen recaptures, bishop comes here. And that's a winning position as well. So really, rook c8 is out of the question. And that's why he didn't play it. Okay, what he in fact played was offering the exchange of queens, queen e5. So again, in keeping with what I said at the beginning of this video, I'm happy to simplify. So we, we trade queens at this point. And so it's already taking the shape of a possible speedy endgame, isn't it? I know there are a few pieces on the board, but uh, that's uh, that's okay. I prefer White's pawn structure here, by the way. The just the two centre pawns missing, and the the A B C pawns and the F G H pawns. I prefer them to the other. The advantage of pawns on the queen side will prove uh, an issue in this game. So I played A three here. I just wondered if perhaps Black had any ideas of playing b5, and then I thought, well, let's let's make it a bit difficult then. I don't know that there's anything better. I can't really see anything better at the moment. It, it could also be regarded as a sort of a waiting move to see which way Black is going to go, whether he's going to castle kingside or queenside. Let's see what he does. Well, he plays the bishop to c6. These bishops look quite good. Norman French was a pretty strong player as well as being uh, one of the officials of the NZCCA and uh, he, he was in fact rated much higher than me and as a result of this win of course my rating catapulted. So it was a very pleasing result. So he's just played 15 bishop c6. So I played rook a b1. It'll become clear in a moment why I'm doing this. Now, castling kingside here is okay. Castling queenside isn't so good because white has the pawn majority on the queenside and his pieces are actively deployed. So what he did is he compromised. He played rook d8. So he's getting his rook on the, the open d-line, but he's not castling on the, the queenside. So... I played rook fd1. So now black did castle kingside, as I thought he would, and he didn't disappoint. Then I played here, b4. This explains why I played a3 a couple of moves ago. And so the reply was knight d5. He's now sort of focusing attention on c3. He might also be wanting to take that knight to f4. So if he played it here, for instance, he'd be homing in on g2 and hitting the bishop. So he might think, well, we can exchange a, a bishop for a knight, and then I have the two bishops against bishop and knight, that occurred to me. So, what happens here? Incidentally, uh, while we're on this, I just thought about this. If he did play b5, wanting to shut down the square c4 for white, what do you think the reply would be to that? The obvious reply, I suppose, is, is knight takes, sorry, knight e4 with the idea of playing eventually to c5. But in this situation, I've looked at it and I would say after knight e4, black can get away with bishop takes e4, bishop takes e4. And then, of course, it, it's not really straightforward because the knight is missing. I, I wanted to do something with that now. So I think the, the answer to that is knight e2.
with the idea of playing f4, in other words, that's on the next move. So knight e2 is stopping knight f5, knight f4, and it's also hitting the bishop on e5. There's no check. Well, there is, but you can easily whip that off, and then the rook would come through. Then there are possibilities maybe with g4 and f5. I think that's okay against b5. But he didn't consider that. Like I said earlier, he did play, in fact, knight d5, not b5. So I did take the knight off. So that is, let's get the move right here. 19, knight takes d5. Now if black were to take with a bishop here, you'd play c4. Just to have a quick look at that. Bishop takes d5, c4. Okay, now white is really expanding on the queen side. He can't take the pawn because the bishop would take on c4. So that's fine. Incidentally, just looking at this position, white does have to be very careful once, if, and when black is able to double rooks on that d-line. That is something that I was thinking about, and uh, I had to recognize that my back rank is a bit weak because... My king cannot escape. There's there's no escape square. H3 would be a, a good move here, but uh, at the moment uh, that is uh, not a possibility. So, given that bishop takes, it's not such a good idea. If he were to take with the pawn, He'd be blocking his d-line and he'd be saddling himself with an isolated pawn. So what he did, in fact, is he played rook takes d5 with the intention, as I saw it, of doubling rooks on the d-line. So what I played here is bishop c1. I moved straight out of Tiger and Petrosian's book. Petrosian was a, a devotee of retreating his pieces to the back rank. And now, of course, white does threaten c4 again, just to show you. Because now this bishop is no longer in the way, and the rook protects the bishop. Although, again, white has to be careful, because should he move this bishop somewhere, the rook is exposed here. But for the moment, at least, the rook has to do something. So that, that probably wouldn't be such a good position. For instance, if he were to move here, then you could play bishop e3, and that would cause black a few problems. So... Let's put that back for a moment. Like I say, white is threatening c4, so what does black do about it? Well, as expected, he played rook fd8. He is doubling the rooks on the d-line. And now he's prevented c4 because he just took the bishop on d3. So I played... Bishop b2. We now enter hypermodern mode a bit late, admittedly, but there it is. So how does black deal with this? He recognises, of course, that there's a nasty little threat here because white is threatening to take the bishop. And should the rook retake, which of course it would have to do, otherwise he'd be a piece down, you then take the h-pawn with check and you pick up the rook down here and you still have this rook covering the back rank. So he has to recognise that this bishop 
is a bit weak. I'm a bit weak on the back rank, but so is he because he has no flight squares either. So we're, we're both in the same position, effectively. We have to watch the back rank. So how does black respond to bishop b2? That's uh, white's 21st move. Like I say, white is threatening here. What would happen if he played bishop takes h2 check? Let's just have a look at that for a moment. Like I say, Cecil Purdy's dictate, check all checks. What happens after that? Well, the king would take, the rook would check here. The king would move back, and then this rook that's here would move here, threatening with the bishop lined up. The only problem with that is we come back into a similar situation with this rook over here. This is unprotected and so the bishop would go straight down. So just to go through that again, if white were to take that, black would check, the king would move back, the rook would move here, and then bishop check, king takes, rook takes, and it's all over. And if he doesn't follow this king h2 up with rook h5, king g1, rook g5, he's lost a piece for nothing. That's the only benefit except for the fact that his back rank is exposed. So bishop h2 is no good. It's a nice try, but uh, it's not good enough. So... Like I say, white has just played 21, bishop b2. So what black does is he takes the bishop, considering that that's the easiest way around it, which it is, there's no doubt about that. White is still a bit weak on the back rank. He's no option but to recapture that bishop rook b2 so that's 22 rook b2 what happens here if black plays e5 let's just have a look at that with the idea of playing e4 thinking that then if white plays bishop takes e4 it's uh, checkmate on d1 Well, the easiest way around that is to play rook e1. And that really stops it. Because if black now plays e4, then in fact, white can play bishop takes e4. If he plays down here, don't take the rook, of course, because you'd be able to play king f1 instead and you protect the rook. So that's the way around that one. And he just lose a pawn. So, although e5 looks pretty nasty then, it is a bit troublesome. It's not all that troublesome. It would be different if black had some support for it so that he could march it on, but I'm afraid that he can't do that. So, for the moment, at least that's not available to him. So, what he in fact played is bishop to b5, hitting the bishop. So, what does white do there? Okay, well, his, his bishop is attacked on d3. He must protect it. He can't move it. Because even if he moved it to e2, there's too much pressure here. Black would take, white would retake, and it would be checkmate on the back rank. So white has no option but to play rook b3, covering that bishop. So how does black respond to 23 rook b3? 
Well, I think taking the bishop on d3 would give drawing chances here because if you can see takes here and rook takes back, an exchange of rooks, white would have an isolated d pawn, but that's not a problem because he could march his king to the center, black would do the same, and it's not exactly clear that white would have a win there, but black certainly wouldn't have a win either. But uh, what he in fact played was here. Bishop a4. And so I took the semi-open C line there with rook c3. That's 24 rook c3. Right, just let's have a look at this position just for a moment here. Why did black play bishop a4? Was he thinking that he could play this? Okay, what happens after that? Well, black probably banked on 24 bishop c2, but found out just in time that it loses, not of course to bishop takes c2, which will be rook takes d1, bishop takes d1, rook d1 mate, but white can play this, rook takes c2. Now you're probably thinking, well, the, the bishop can be taken on d3. Yes, it can. What's the problem with that? Well, the problem is if he takes the bishop, you take back. And he takes here. And then you give check here. He puts the rook back and you mate him. And so black's back rank weaknesses are totally exposed. And I think that that is the problem with bishop a4. I'm not saying that it's a losing move, but it, it doesn't provide him with the win that he probably thought that it did. And so he didn't play bishop takes c2. Like I keep saying, white does have back rank weaknesses, but so does black. So that's the position after... Let me get this right. 24, rook, c3. So he played g6. He's giving himself that flight square. There's, there's the recognition that he knew that he'd blundered without blundering. He just miscalculated it. So now, of course, he is threatening bishop takes c2. So have a look at that for a moment. What about rook c7 there? What's, what's the, the position after this? Well, again, there's a bit of the Cecil Purdy about this. When he advocated, if you know that you're going to have to play a move, not on the next move, your very next move, but the move after. Try substituting it for the present move and see how it works. Well, this is going to have to be played, but not just yet. If you play that, the problem with that is that... He comes here and he locks White's rook in. Many would say, well, you can go here. And if he takes here, then you take here. The problem is if you move this bishop, you're exposing yourself to a back rank mate again. So that, that is the problem with an immediate rook c7. So you don't want that. So what do you do? Let's take a look at it for a moment. Well, you get away from the d-line, you play rook e1. And now you are threatening rook c7. So how does black respond to that? Well, he plays king g7. 
and then white plays rook to c7. Now's the right time because if bishop to c6, now white can get away with bishop takes a6, and then if b takes a, rook takes the bishop on c6. And in this position, incidentally, if after this, just a moment. Let's play bishop c6. After this, he's not forced to take the bishop. He can play this. Now, of course, it would be suicide to take that rook because then it would be rook takes d1. The bishop would have to come back in. And then Black's bishop can come here and White's in all sorts of problems. But the way that you get around it is by playing that. You don't take the rook. And now, of course, we're back with if Black plays BA, his rook takes C6. And if he takes the rook here, you can take with a king. And then if the rook checks, you can go king e2 and you escape. So that's not a problem. So. Let's pop that back for a moment. Right, so we are after 26 rook c7. And he doesn't play bishop c6. So what does he play? This is after white's 26th move rook c7. And he's hitting the b-pawn here. The idea of bishop c6, of course, immediately is to protect the b-pawn. So how does he protect it? Well, he played rook on 8 to d7. Okay, well, in that position, I was quite happy to exchange rooks. He took back. I played here. What does black reply to that? He has the D-line. Is he threatening anything? Well, he played f5. He's clearly wanting to stop bishop e4. So I played f4. Now I do have a flat square for the king, so that's perfectly all right. And he played king f6. So it's position after 29, king f6. When I played this, my idea was to bring the king across and then cover the bishop and play c4. But I decided in view of black's strategy here, I'd take the e-line again, and we'll see why in a moment. Now, in my opinion, at this stage, black's 30th move is incomprehensible. Although, in reality, as the game moves along, it does seem to have a little bit of merit. What would you play here? 
What can black do? What is white wanting to do? Well, this is a nice square here for the rook, isn't it? The problem is, if black were to move his rook here to try and stop this, you could play bishop c4, hitting the rook. And that's probably why he played what he did. He played b5. And this is locking in the black bishop. But like I say, wanting to stop white playing c4. Or bishop c4. Preferably bishop c4 at the moment, but c4 is the, the key square there. So black's bishop now, as it stands, is out of play. Is that good? Well, I replied rook e5. So I get my rook to where I want it to be. So what can... What can be made of this? What is white wanting to do here? Well, I think anyone would say it would be nice to get that rook to c5. And then eventually at some point play c4. So what black does is he plays rook c7. Now here, he believes he can stop rook c5 by white. What do you think? That's the position after 31 rook c7. It's still even in material. Six pawns each, and a rook and a bishop each. I'll pause the, the video at this stage, and we'll come back to it for a shorter video to finish this game off. Like I say, this is the position after 31 rook c7, where black believes he's preventing 32 rook c5. Have a look at that, and uh, in a while I'll, uh, I'll give you the uh, conclusion to this. And thank you very much for watching, and goodbye for now.